Welcome to First Lutheran Church, where you're among friends in Christ. I'm Reverend Thomas Rothy. I'm glad you've joined us today, and it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit, working through the Gospel, touches your heart and changes your life. May the Lord bless you today and throughout the rest of the week. Our first, or Old Testament, lesson is recorded in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. We read the 37th chapter, beginning at the first verse. In Ezekiel's vision, the people of Israel are depicted in their spiritual deadness as dry bones covering a valley floor. At the command of God, Ezekiel preaches the word to them and calls the bones to life again. I invite you to follow along with the lessons. They're printed on the back side of this morning's bulletin. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, These bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Here ends our first lesson. Our second, or epistle lesson for the day, of which a portion will serve as our sermon text, is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans. We read the 8th chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. The close connection between the life of the believer and the life of Christ is emphasized by the Apostle Paul. Our life in Christ brings both blessing and obligation. Blessing in the status of sonship, graciously established by the Holy Spirit, 
and obligation in living as befits those led by the Spirit as children of God. We read, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh, to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Here ends our second lesson. The gospel lesson for the day is recorded in the gospel of St. John. We read the 11th chapter, selected verses. Just prior to his entrance into Jerusalem, Jesus raises Lazarus to life. To the consternation of the Pharisees, the people see the miracle and then put their hope in Jesus, we read. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard the news that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
the dead man came out. Here ends our gospel lesson. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, our sermon text for this morning is part of today's second lesson. Dear friends in Christ, I'm sure you've heard the expression, I owe you one. When might someone hear that? Probably when someone's the recipient of a favor. Maybe someone picked up the tab at the restaurant. I owe you one. Or maybe someone bailed you out of an uncomfortable situation. I owe you one. Now, even though these favors are nice, there's another favor that's even nicer. And that's the favor of being changed from a child of the devil to a child of God. A line from one of our hymns reminds us of that. Salvation unto us has come by God's free grace and favor. Because God has provided such a wonderful favor, aren't you compelled to ask, what do I owe you? Well, see, first of all, that I have become a a child of God. And secondly, now I live as a child of God. Paul begins, Therefore, brothers and sisters, We have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. What do I owe you? According to the Apostle Paul, each of us owes someone something because I became a child of God. Prior to that happening, whose child was I? Sin and Satan. Has sin and Satan done me any favors? Do I owe sin and Satan anything? No and no. But as a child of sin and Satan, I was its slave. When tempted in thought, word, and deed, I gave in to that temptation hook, line, and sinker. And by conforming my earthly existence to sin and Satan, I was really contracting my eternity to sin and Satan's punishment of death. What do I owe you, God? Have you done me any favors? Oh, yes. As founding church father... Martin Luther summarized in his explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed, You have redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, 
from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his, referring to Jesus, holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did, again referring to Jesus, that I should be his own. God the Father, in his grace, promised and sent his son Jesus to redeem the world from sin, changing my status from a child of sin and Satan to a child of God. When did you become a child of God? Our sermon text hints at an answer when it mentions spirit with the capital letter S. The Holy Spirit delivers the favor when he called you to faith through the gospel. Maybe it was through baptism as a small child. Through water and the word, your sins were washed away and your sinful old Adam was drowned by contrition and repentance. Or maybe it was through hearing the gospel as you got a little older. Whenever and wherever the gospel is present, the Holy Spirit is present, creating and strengthening faith. As Paul also wrote to the Roman Christians, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of God. As a child of God, That makes you a recipient of all God the Father's blessings. First and foremost is that blessing of the forgiveness of sins. God really did us a favor by providing the blessing of the forgiveness of sins because it isn't something that we can obtain on our own. When God the Father sent his son Jesus to live and die as mankind's substitute, he won the forgiveness of sins for all people. And it's through the Holy Spirit's gift of faith that an individual received this forgiveness of sins won by Jesus through his perfect life and innocent suffering and death. Another blessing is life. Again, God really did us a favor by blessing us with this blessing of life because it isn't something that we can obtain on our own. Mankind might think that it can create life through conception, and mankind might think that it can sustain life medical science. But it can't. God gave mankind life because he wanted mankind to live eternally with him in his presence. And even after the world's first human sinned, God still wanted mankind to forever be in his presence. That's why he sent Jesus, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Another blessing is salvation. Yes, God really did do us a favor by providing us with this blessing of salvation, because it isn't something that we can obtain on our own. Mankind might think that it can save itself from sin and its punishment through work or self-righteousness, but it can't. God alone is the sole source and author of salvation. 
He sent the great rescuer, Jesus Christ, to rescue all mankind from Satan's evil clutches. And through faith that God the Holy Spirit works, his rescue becomes my rescue. And I become a child of God. Paul continues, The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. What do I owe you? According to the Apostle Paul, each of us owes someone something. And that's to live as a child of God. Easier said than done? It doesn't have to be. Instead of following the path the sinful flesh lays out, and that means also following it like a slave, following his master's every command, we're now able to walk the path of Christ's righteousness, empowered and guided by God the Holy Spirit. That means that I can share in Christ's suffering by enduring persecution. Maybe it's enduring ridicule at school, on the job, in a social setting, for not following the crowd and being a goody two-shoes. But sharing in Christ's suffering also enables you to share in his glory. You can wear your Christianity like a badge on your chest, witnessing to everyone that he's the reason I'm following him and not sin. Of course, the ultimate glory that you'll receive is living for all eternity in the mansions of heaven. Luther's explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed concludes, and live under him, again referring to Jesus, in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. How can you live as a child of God? As scripture encourages, by loving the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. That means make the one true God your number one in life. Make the true God your nearest and dearest treasure. Then make your fellow man close second. Didn't Jesus say when describing himself as the king in that account of the sheep and goats, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. What do I owe you, God? I know that I can never repay you for rescuing me from sin and its punishment and for making me a child of yours. But I also know the very least, by grace, through faith, I can live as a child of yours. 
May your whole life reflect the love that God first showed to you in Christ. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. spending some time with us today. You have been watching First Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Reverend Thomas Rothy invites you to tune in again next week, or if you have the opportunity to worship with us live on Sunday morning at 9.30. First Evangelical Lutheran Church is located at 231 Smoke Tree Lane, Prescott, Arizona. If you're in need of spiritual assistance or would just like more information, please call 445 2807. May God's word guide you this week.